Hey, this is Les from the TV Dudes. This week, I was lucky enough to chat with Steve Skaya. He's the creator and producer, alongside Matt Fetterman, of the new CBS series Blood and Treasure. It's a globetrotting adventure show that recently started its 13-episode run, and Steve took some time out of his day to chat with me about how he and Matt split showrunning duties, his favorite parts of producing, and what the project means to him. I hope you enjoy. Hi, this is Les. Hi, Les. This is Steve Skaya. Hi. Thank you so much for taking out your time today. I really appreciate it. No problem. No problem. Happy to do it. You got, you've been doing a lot of great promo for the show, so I'm going <laughs> to do my part. Well, thank you. Uh, I got to talk to Matt yesterday and through a technical difficulty, uh, failed to record the call. So I'm absolutely Ooh. mortified, but yeah. So uh, he and I are going to reschedule and uh, hopefully... Nothing of the sort plagues me today. <laughs> he and I had spoken a bit about the division of labor and how you and he work together. Kind of coming off West Wing, seeing kind of a co-show runner vibe and, and, and learning to make that work with what you both wanted to do eventually with your careers. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about uh, making Blood and Treasure, going from it being a, a, a collaborative idea to that point where you have to start splitting location, where I, you know, you physically, especially with this globe hopping of a show, you know, are going to be someplace radically different time zone than, than say, the writer's room. Yeah, I mean, it, sh sure. I mean, it, it all started back when we were PAs and, you know, he was always very interested in the writing and I was actually I had gone to film school and I had made some films in college, and so I was much more interested in the actual physical production of of the storytelling part of things, much less more so than the the sort of written word part of it. Um, and as the sort of director of the of the team, if there is such a thing, I was always very visual, and I was um, always really interested in being on set and being a part of the process of the actual production from day to day. Um, and uh, I got the opportunity to be on to be on set a lot when we were in when we when they actually made television shows in LA, and um, and things changed when we actually hold on let me let me back up um, for for me I'd always been much more interested in sort of the visual side of the storytelling and the physical means of production and so when we had the opportunity to work together we both sort of had the, we both drifted towards the thing we were more interested in. To me, it was being on set every day and the problem solving of being on set. And I love the, we always talk about um, that moment in Apollo 13 where they've got the, the air filter mm -hmm. and they need to make the square one fit into the round one using nothing but the things on the table. Yeah, yeah. And to me, that is, that is filmmaking at its best where you can sometimes have your best moments in these, moments of despair where you think nothing's working and you actually find something really great in the necessity of having to shoot something at that moment or being out of time and not being able to shoot everything you've got on the page. You've got to condense four pages of television into 30 seconds. And so for me, I was really lucky because when we started out in our careers, we were shooting a lot in Los Angeles and the showrunners we worked for were really, um, they were really supportive of me being on set and sitting behind the director and being the writer on set to help with dialogue. But then, you know, I also had a really good handle on the physical production of things too. So I was able to help with sort of in-scene editing and, and helping tweak performances. And as we went on, I got a little bit more responsibility to the point where the last shows I was working on, I was, I was able to travel to be on set to be the voice of the producers and the writers on set. And that's, that was my, my favorite part of the job. I know Matt loves to be in the writer's room where the idea is born. I like to be on set where the idea is executed. And there's so much about that that is exciting because you never quite know what you're going to get on the day with the location. You never know what you're going to get with guest actors. You know that the actors on the show, if you have a relationship with them, you know what they are good at and capable of, what they will like and what they won't like. And you know how to talk to them to help them find the character. Um, 
if it rains and you've got to move to a new place, how do you shoot the scene? Like all that stuff is the parts that I love about the show. And it wasn't a big deal when we shot in LA, but as we started to get further and further from Los Angeles to make television as it is these days, I was the one who was always on the road. And so I got to shoot in some pretty great places to begin with. But then when the opportunity for blood and treasure came along, it became clear that we were going to have to not, we were going to have to split up and be in different places during the making of the show. So Matt was back in LA writing with the writing staff. And I was out on set with the set, with the crew uh, making the show. And it was really exciting to be far away. Um, it wasn't easy to be far away from, you know, we call it headquarters um, of Los Angeles, but we adapted really, really well. And I think that Matt and I having been working together for so long we can sort of finish each other's sentences and read each other's minds. And at the same time, we're both very different people who like different things. And so there's a lot of times on set where I would think about a scene as it's happening and be like, I think, I think Matt would have an issue with this. And I would, I think his tweak would be this thing. And so there'd be ways we'd be able to tweak stuff in the moment with putting on my Fetterman hat. And I know reading scripts too, um, I could tell when I read something and it clearly went through the filter of Matt being like, I think Steve would have an issue with this and he would probably solve it this way. And so we, we developed a really good shorthand of even though we weren't geographically in the same place, we were able to work together really well. The time difference when we were in Montreal wasn't so bad. It was three hours difference. And so we were able to stay in contact pretty well. But once we got as far away as Morocco and nine hours away, uh, it got trickier to communicate uh, in real time. Uh, but we also got much better about sort of saying, okay, here are the things that are coming up in the next day. Keep an eye on this stuff. And, or, hey, here are the things that happened on set today. And here's the things we're going to need to address for tomorrow because the location doesn't do this or it rained. And so we couldn't get this shot and we ran out of time. And it just became part of the process of making the show. Yeah, I was going to ask if I, I would assume some level of shorthand kind of has to develop. Uh, or there would be real danger, you know, in, in kind of a disconnect for the show that, uh, you know, you couldn't just randomly pair necessarily uh, two folks to work together and, and trust that. Absolutely. Yep. And, and two, it's, um, it's interesting to me because if, if Matt wasn't someone I'd known for so long and we hadn't sort of shared a brain at this point, it would have been a lot harder to make the show work. Um, because so much of the show is from the two of us. Uh, it's not, it's not Matt's show or my show it really is something that's sort of born out of both of us where there are certain lines of dialogue that are, that are his, there's certain, um, moments in the show that are mine, but there's also parts where some of my favorite parts of the show, I can't remember whose idea it was. And I think those are always the best moments of the show where you kind of look back on a moment like, Oh, that really works. Where do we come up with that? And it's just like, just sort of like the, the, the good stuff serendipitously just sort of happens. I think one of the first DVD commentaries I ever listened to was for Fight Club. And uh, they have Chuck Palahniuk, who wrote the book, and Jim Oles, who did the screenplay. And there's a moment where they get confused as to what was invented for the screenplay and whether that was from the, I think, Palahniuk attributes something to Oles. And he's like, no, 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 man, that's in your book. And <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And he's like, oh, no, I just figured that was so slick. I couldn't have thought of that. That had to be Jim. Uh, <laughs> and I, it's just, yeah, those those moments can be really wonderful on a project. Uh, this being more of, of your baby, was there, rather than, say, uh, adapted from source material, stuff like Human Target or Charlie's Angels or Limitless, sure. uh, do you feel like you treated it any different on set? Was, it, did it, was there any you know, more butterflies in your stomach? I mean, honestly, I think that um, the key to doing a good job as an onset producer is having the confidence in the material. So knowing that because Matt and I have been with this since the moment of inception and, and seeing a hundred different versions of a script in your head and then a thousand different ways you could shoot it mm -hmm. and having the flexibility of just trusting that every decision you've made up until this moment has gotten you to the moment you are in and knowing that uh, if you're stuck and you're behind schedule or you're out of your, the rain is forcing you to push to another location or um, the special, like the special effect on set isn't working. Although that very rarely happened. Gaspar is a, uh, is a mad genius, our, um, our effects guy. Uh, the, 
the idea is you just can sh- look around and trust the people around you to help you solve the problem because if you've assembled your team correctly, you can trust them to get you through the situation. And there's a lot of times where, especially when we were really off, far away from home, either in the Alps or in uh, the middle of Morocco in the desert, that things didn't go as planned, but we got through it because we were all able to lean on each other because everyone there was the best at what they did, and it was the major leagues. And we had an all-star team, and we really could count on them to collectively all solve the problem. Did you have any uh, uh, happiest accident that springs up without spoiling anything in the show, obviously? Uh, any days that went wrong and or, or went amazingly right? I will say that, for sure, I think that, for me, one of my favorite moments in the entire show is the very last scene of the season and I won't give away where it is or what it is about uh, but it started as a four-ish page scene um, that was kind of a wrap-up and uh, it was our last day in Montreal what we what, the way the show worked is we shot the first chunk in Montreal so we shot about 70 or so days in in Montreal and then we went on the road and we shot everything else um, out of sequence from every episode And so the last day in Montreal was the last scene of the last episode of season one. And there was a really great scene that we'd written that went there and we were on something ridiculous, like hour 19 of our day. And we weren't going to be able to make it through the day. 19 hours of shooting is a long time. Um, And you're getting to the point where you want to pull the plug just so everyone can go home and not crash their cars because they're so tired. Um, we had shot all day long and into the night and the sun was about to come up again. And we were stuck because we couldn't stop for the night and pick it up the next day because we were all literally getting on a plane the next day to fly to Rome to do the next part of the show. And, um, it was me and Steve Boyum and we were sitting there trying to figure out how to get ourselves out of this problem because it was four pages of dialogue after a night's worth of action. And I'd been having a conversation with someone to try to describe what that last scene of the show was about. And I had described it in a really sort of quick shorthand way. And then as I was sitting there talking to, to Steve Boyum about it and how do we solve this problem? I said, it's, you know, it's kind of like this, this thing. And he said, Oh yeah. Okay. I, I get it. And I'm like, but you know what we could do is we could actually just do that thing. And we managed to take four pages of dialogue and turn it into about 30 seconds of television. We shot it out got through the night and I will say it is probably one of the most interesting, sweetest scenes of the show because there there is no dialogue and it's all the emotion of these people who've been together for however many months we'd all been a a team at that point. Um, And it was really emotional. And I think it's maybe, um, maybe my favorite part of the show and the fact that it happens to be the last scene of, of the season. And it's all born out of the fact that, We didn't have time to shoot four pages of dialogue. That's beautiful. That's great. Uh, It reminds me of the the Harrison Ford being sick on set indie story of uh, him just pulling the gun because he didn't feel like the fight scene. It is so funny because that's the story I tell all the time about. That is my favorite moment in in all of movies, and it's born out of an accident. Mm -hmm. But it's such a great, perfect character moment that fits so well with the tone of the movie and everything yeah it just feels like it was made that way and yeah. i love moments like that i love that i love the uh i be i love you i know is another one of those from mm-hmm. empire strikes back it's like that's not in the script and that's just something they tried because they didn't know what else to do in that moment and again one of the greatest moments yeah yeah you would you would swear that that was concrete foundational to the you know that that was the first idea that the script was born from and no that 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 was a cherry on top Right. And also a great example of if you've got people who know the material and know the characters, you could trust them to to get you out of the problem. Because in both of those moments, Harrison Ford knew the solution to the problem because he knows Indiana Jones and he knows Han Solo so well. He's like, well, I think my character would just do this. And that's what I loved about our cast is our cast was so all in on this. Um, No matter how big or small the part was, everyone really got into it because everyone understood the show we were trying to make and the fact that we weren't Reinventing television, we were just trying to have a, a fun time making a big, giant summer blockbuster on TV. Yeah. And everyone dove in on it, and they were all so game 
that they made the show so much better because they brought so many great ideas to the show and they actually brought their own little bucket lists of things they wanted to do on the show that we were able to tap into later on in the season when we started running out of ideas. It's like, oh, wait, oh, that's right. Gags always want to do this. Oh, and Sophia <laughs> always said she wanted to do this. And it was a lot of fun. We still got a bunch of things on our bucket list for hopefully next season um, of things we want to do with our cast. Yeah, I, I really can't believe that, that no one has put Matt Barr in a show like this prior he all all of the cast really seemed just made for this uh getting to i got to talk to mark uh last week and uh i mean he's just i i'm still shocked he's from tennessee but he just he's this perfect danny ilo <laughs> right hudson hawkish kind of vibe he brings to it is just perfect uh katia as 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 gwen uh when i spoke to her she talked about how happy she was to get to play this uh very Swedish character, and I really feel like the whole ensemble brings what it needs to to a really fun summer uh, swashbuckling kind of adventure. Yeah, and they, they all do a really great job of knowing their character and not trying to make their character do things their character wouldn't do. So they're, the thing that's great about people like Shaw or Katya or Gags is they're never trying to make the same jokes that 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 Danny and Lexi are making, they're mm-hmm. making mm-hmm. jokes for their characters. And it all really works because it makes, it makes the scenes funnier because they're not reaching for anybody else's jokes. They're trying to make the character specific jokes. And there's, there's been a couple times where a joke wasn't working and it's like, actually, I don't think that's a me joke. I think that's a you joke. And then you try it the other way around. I'm like, oh, it is way funnier. That is totally, it's the, in the way we're saying it, that's totally a thing Chuck would say as opposed to somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can see that. Because yeah, it doesn't feel like they're reaching for each other's you know, there's three zingers in this scene, and, and you got to each try to get one. Uh, it it exactly. very much feels like that's that is how Father Chuck would bag on Danny a little bit, and that's how Lexi would joke back, and it, it would be different. Mm-hmm. Getting to do things like Limitless, like Charlie's Angels, like Human Target, have you? Has it, was there a favorite moment in there where you thought, "Oh my God, I get to do this with that"? You know, first of all, Blood and Treasure is, has been a dream come true on so many levels from everything everything from just the idea of getting to finally do a Treasure Hunter show, where I don't mm-hmm. know if Matt talked about this at all, but we'd, we'd gone through five or six different versions of the Treasure Hunter show before they, mm-hmm. they let us make one. And, um, and, and just the scope of it of seeing the world and being able to basically put a pin in a map and figure out a way to get there. And then nine months later, you're standing in the middle of the Sahara Desert. And that's, that's pretty amazing. On top of that, I think that, you know, the experience of making TV for me has always been, I've always wanted to try a lot of different things and, and really get out and live life. And I think it's fun as a writer when you get to experience those things and you can write something ridiculous. I remember in Jericho, the first example of that, where I really felt, oh, wow, I can't believe they pay me to do this, where we had an episode in this post-apocalyptic drama that we called the Wells Fargo Wagon episode, where... Um, a tank and a platoon of Marines showed up in this this isolated town after mm-hmm. the apocalypse, promising rebuilding, and it turned out it was all, spoiler alert, it turned out they were con men who had stolen a tank and uniforms. Mm-hmm. And the tank part was so crucial to me, to the visual of the show, because being able to see a tank roll down Main Street USA would be a pretty stunning visual that you don't see on TV every day. Yeah, And so I pitched it in the room, and, and Carol liked it, and then it stayed on the board as an idea, but we all kind of knew it would be expensive and hard to make happen. And I remember we talked to our line producer at that point about doing it. We wrote into the script and he's like, look, kids, it's a good idea, but you're on glue. And, uh, and so we just assumed, okay, at some point it's going to turn into a truck or uh, maybe a Humvee if we're lucky. Mm-hmm. And when we finished the script, the script came out and it, and it was such an important part of the episode visually to tell that story that um, the line producer who I, I believe was actually like a, like had was a, was an army vet and had driven tanks in Vietnam had said some version of like, okay, I know a guy we can talk to. And then he put us in a van, drove us out to the middle of the Mojave desert to this weird, strange camp full of army equipment and said, there's a lot of tanks. Take out the one you want. And let's never speak of this again. And it's great. It's a really great moment in that episode. But it's also great because not only is that episode better for having the tank in it, that tank then becomes an important part of story for the rest of that season. Because when our heroes get that tank at the end of the episode, 
they're able to use it later on and pull it out of nowhere like Han Solo at the end of Star Wars to save the town. Yeah, I I absolutely loved Jericho and had a close friend that that was our, you know, hey, come over and hang out and we'll watch this week's Jericho show, which I hadn't had that with somebody in a while. So it was a fun show. Plus the the whole fandom campaign and, and whatnot was just yeah absolutely pretty great. Pretty great. Yeah. Yep. Um, and yeah, and that, that tank sells the con. Yeah, exactly. One of the things that I really enjoy on blood and treasure is the, or didn't expect really was the amount of time hopping, uh, and, and amount of backstory that, that each character has. Um, as far as the, the visual of how do you drop an audience in and not lose them, uh, can you talk a bit about how you worked through those problems or, or what concerns kind of arose? For sure. I mean, we, we always knew we wanted to have flash, flashbacks be a part of the show, not just to sell the, the character backstories, but also you cannot have a treasure in a story without Nazis. <laughs> and mm-hmm. today, today Nazis are not nearly as, as easy to tell a story about as World War II Nazis, especially when the whole idea of World War II, we, Matt and I talk about it a lot, where it just felt like it was, it was a giant art heist. <laughs> um, it was, it was an, an entire country full of people trying to steal the cultural identity of the rest of the planet. And so for us, we knew we wanted flashbacks to be a part of the show. We also knew we didn't want to lose people in the storytelling with a lot of strange, out-of-sequence um, plot. Uh, it was great in the room. We had uh, a close friend of ours, uh, Javier Grigio Markswatch, who is yeah. um, a fantastic writer but had worked on Boomtown and one of my favorite shows. And that show was all about time hopping and perspective and the sort of Rashomon style of storytelling. And he was able to walk us through, okay, here are the lessons we learned on that show about the ways you can do this without hurting people's heads and the way that people will need to get the information. And learning from their mistakes, we were able to build it in a very specific way. But outside of all of that, when we got to shooting it, we knew that we were going to want it to look a little different, not black and white, um, like an episode of Cold Case, um, but stylized in a way that you knew you were seeing something a little bit different. And so mm-hmm. that's where we worked with, uh, with Tony Wahlberg, our DP, to sort of find a style for those flashbacks that you can shoot them and, shoot them and then in post-production, you can color correct them, you can treat them. You can wash out colors, you can pull out certain colors, other colors, and you can really tell you're in a different time and place. And then the last piece of that puzzle were the maps. And for us, the maps were always something we wanted to do as our homage to Indiana Jones, mm-hmm. um, but in our own modern way. And that, the maps really helped anchor us in time and place by being able to tell us exactly where we were and where we were going and what year we were in. And that really helped, I think, make it a nice, clean transition for people so they knew. I think you're right. I think the the map Indiana Jones not as well. It it helped me know not just the information, but the type of show I'm about to watch a little bit. Right. Uh, like, all right, all right. This is going to be a uh, all across the globe, all across history, blood antiquities. Let's see, you know, let's see what happens. Exactly. Uh, I can't thank you enough for taking out your time today, and uh, and I really am looking forward to seeing what happens this season, and hopefully, uh, what treasure y'all go after next in, uh, in uh, season two. <laughs> we've, we've got a plan. And the thing we always say is, you know, the idea of the show is it's, it is a, it is a summer TV show. It was, it was never built to be a fall show. It was always, we originally developed it as a fall show, but CBS mm-hmm. had the good, good, good peace of mind to say, actually, we think this might be better for summer. And so we started from scratch and completely re-engineered it. Instead of it being sort of a treasure procedural, it became this, big giant globe trotting serialized adventure and because of that we see it as every season is in success every season is its own sort of summer novel so this season you see one treasure one bad guy a certain part of the world and hopefully in then in subsequent seasons we'll wrap up that story at the end of 13 episodes for this season and then should we get to tell more adventures we still have the same treasure squad or those of them, those of the treasure squad that make it out of the season um and take us to a new place in the world, give us a new bad guy and a new treasure to search for. Blood and treasure is clearly the title that you should go with, but uh, I'll, I'll be honest. Treasure squad would also have worked. 
exclamation point and everything. Treasure Squad. I'd, I'd watch the hell out of that. Yeah. <laughs> Can't disagree. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and, uh, and have a great rest of your day. My pleasure. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye. The TV Dudes is an independently run podcast and a member of the Electric Sweater Podcast Network. We are exclusively listener supported. If you'd like to help us out, go to patreon.com slash TV Dudes. You can like us on Facebook and Twitter at TV Dudes. All the music for our show is by our friend and original TV dude, Gregory J. Amani Smith. To find out more about us, go to the TV Dudes.com and electricsweater.com. I'm Grant Davis. Thanks for listening.